often hear nicknames or compound names which describe a person's character. For example, in Russia we see two men named Ivan with completely different reputations. Ivan the Moneybag was a Russian Grand Duke of Moscow who was famous for being generous with his wealth. And Ivan the Terrible was the first Tsar who executed his rivals to gain absolute power. We find compound names in scripture which reveal God's character. God's name, Jehovah or Yahweh, is paired with a description of God's character. In this session we're looking at Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. This name only appears once in the whole of the Bible. God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. In our culture this is a normal understanding of God, but in ancient times many people thought each region had its own God. This included the followers of Jehovah. The best example of this is Jonah, who thought he could escape God by running away. And we know now he could not run from God. David proclaims his own revelation in his song, Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. But this presents us with a paradox. God is everywhere all the time, but his presence is often manifest in a tangible way in a specific time or place. There are many examples of this in the Bible. When Moses is at the burning bush, God's presence is manifest in the bush. When God gave Israel the Ten Commandments, they all saw his presence and were afraid. In the desert, when the Jews were wandering, the presence of God was in the pillar of cloud and fire. And finally, when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were in the furnace, God was there with them. So for the Jewish people, it was normal to have the presence of God manifest among them. The truth is, God is everywhere all the time, but at certain points we see him or his glory manifest in a special way. That leads us to the question, what's the difference between the omnipresent and the manifest presence of God? Omnipresence is, God is everywhere without us being aware of it. God's manifest presence is the result of his interaction with us, overtly and unmistakably. It's when we experience God. In other words, the manifest presence of God is about us becoming aware of his presence. The glory of the Lord is revealed among us. For Ezekiel, who uses this name, Jehovah Shammah, the presence of God is something of great value. At the start of his book, he's calling for people to repent and turn back to God. And then in chapter 10, he's horrified when he has a vision of the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. God's finally got fed up with his people's constant rebellion and literally leaves the temple. This is a truly depressing event, and for the Jewish people, a turning point which many did not even notice. Jehovah has left the building. But Ezekiel does not close his book on this depressing note. In the very last sentence of his book, he speaks of the hope before us. He closes by describing his vision of the future, of the new Jerusalem. He prophesies of a city where God will dwell. Chapter 48 verse 35 says, And the name of the city from that time will be Jehovah Shammah, which translates in English to mean the Lord is there. This new Jerusalem is a foreshadow of both the church and of heaven. When he's describing the New Jerusalem, he's seeing what is to come. The Lord who dwells with his people. For us, this has two specific meanings. First, God is present, or God is there, in his church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's here, right now. We are in his presence. We're seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. The second meaning is that the hope of heaven is to be present with the Lord. One of the outstanding features of our heavenly hope is that God's presence is manifest. When we die and are resurrected or we go to meet him in the air, 
we will be in his physical presence day by day. Paul writes, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far greater. So what does this mean for me? Well, it should alter our behaviour. The first reaction of those who meet God in the Old Testament is always the same. They're in awe. The awareness of the presence of God provokes a response of fear and repentance. In Exodus 3 verse 5, Moses takes off his shoes and covers his face because he's afraid. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the Lord and says, Woe to me! I'm ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Do we speak and act as though Jesus were in the room? Do we watch or read what we would if Jesus were here with us? The presence of God should provoke us to repentance. Secondly, it should cause us to seek the manifestation of his presence. If we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, why does it not feel like it all the time? Well, we're not very good at looking into the spiritual realm. We've become dominated by the physical and our spiritual eyes are dim. Paul says we see imperfectly now, one day we shall see in full. But don't let us settle for dim eyes. We need to take the time to let God open our eyes to see. In Kings, Elisha could see an army of angels, but his servant Gehazi could not see. So Elisha prays and Gehazi's eyes are opened and he can see thousands of angels all around. The result of that was that his attitude to everything in the physical realm changed. As I finish, let's make this song our prayer today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you.